I'm Jen Matthews, the Sport Development Manager here at Rowing WA, for those that don't know me. Uh, I'm very excited about this evening's Out of Power. I'm pleased to present Matt Doyle, Waste Biomech, and Brett Aleph, head coach from Waste. I'll we'll hand it over to the boys. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Matt. That's Brett. Thank you for so when Jen contacted me, she asked me to do us, sorry, to do a presentation on rowing technology versus advanced rigging. Um, I'm going to pull my hand up now and go. There's going to be very little advanced rigging on most of the technology. Okay, that's where my sit. That's my sphere. Um, if you've got advanced rigging questions, talk to this man next to me. Okay. Um, but I think quite a, a few of you would have been at a presentation we gave a couple of years ago at a rowing conference. Some of the information here is going to be similar, but I've changed it a bit because we were focusing on the peach rowing system because a lot of people are starting to use it in WA at the time. We focus very much in on that. What I'm trying to do today is demonstrate more what rowing technology is out there. Okay, what's available to use. There's a lot of stuff coming on the market in various aspects. Um, we won't assess too much of it. I'm just going to show you what's out there, what does it do, where does it sit in terms of the variety of people that we've got sitting in this room. We will then go and look at some information from the feature biomet system, which we'll talk about in a sec, um, purely to show what can you get out of these sorts of tools. We won't spend too much time on that because I just want to get familiar with the data, and then we're going to actually go into some applied examples. Okay, and I want to spend a bit more time on that than we have previously. So we've got some pretty relevant applied examples. We've got some information from the under-23 men's four, which is one of gold medal. And world's best time. Um, we've got and a couple of other groups. We've got the men's single that was at world champ, uh, under 23 world champs as well. What I would encourage, if there's any questions, I don't want to. We don't want to lecture. We can't want to have an involved discussion. So if there's anything you want to know, stick your hand up, just yell out, whatever, and, and please let's have it as, as open as possible. So without further ado, growing technology for your athlete, for your crew, for your club, for your school, however you want to look at it. Of course, my clicker just stops working. <laughs> Sorry about this. Always have uh, technology, it's good, isn't it? <laughs> Let's try that again. Beauty of antiviruses. I can see it while it is just. Okay, cool. So, number one thing technology is not reliable. Okay, so rowing technology, what are we going to talk about today? I'm going to talk about gates, instrumented gates. Um, there's quite a few of them around, they come in different shapes and forms. One of the things where we started off a few years ago, a number of years ago, was instrumenting the oars. Okay? That's now coming back into vogue. There's a few new contraptions coming out where instead of focusing on putting stuff on the boat, we can then put it back on the oar again. Okay? So we're going to have a look at some of them. We're going to go through a few smartphone apps. And by no means is it an extensive list. And we're going to go through a few other things that we can apply to rowing in a sphere that we see. So instrumented gates. Peach. Okay, it's a gate. Um, instrumented gate, you take off your existing gate and slot straight onto the pin that already exists. Uh, limitation is you there's no pitch adjustment. Okay? It's pretty much the accepted system in Australia currently within the SAS system of Rome, Australia, etc. You also have foot stretcher force, which we'll talk about a bit later on. So just on that, if you've got four four wedges in your pitch, you put that on, it's the same. Absolutely. If you've got five three, it's different. If you've got six two, it's different. So if you don't have four four on your inserts, and you put a pitch gate on, the athlete will feel different. But the number one thing when you put an athlete on different equipment is you don't want to feel different. 
one for the same. So the pitch, the lack of pitch means you need to measure pitch and make sure it's the same. It's not four for inserts, it's not the same. And conversely, one of the reasons I do <coughs> like it is because it uses a gate that everyone, pretty much everyone's using. Right? So the athletes don't feel the difference through the gate. And they have full stretch. And they have full stretch for which we will talk about. Okay, awe inspired. Some of you have probably heard it about awe inspired. Um, it's been coming on the market for a couple of years now. Uh, it's been developed within Australia. A guy from Queensland has been working on it for, I think, over 10 years. Growing WA is uh, growing Australia, has invested in awe inspired resin heavily. And I'd anticipate that this is going to become the accepted system in Australia. It's similar, it's an instrumented gate. It does a few more things, um, which we won't go into in depth. It does foot stretcher force. It will be wireless. Currently it's wired, it will be wireless. Um, Peach is working on a wireless system as well. And it has a little monitor, as Peach does, to get some information back. And it has pitch adjustment. And it has pitch adjustment. So. So. Weaver Row X, this is going back a bit in time, but it's still around. Okay. Um, this probably reinvigorated biomechanics in rowing in Australia. Before this, there was a few different systems floating around. Um, most of them fairly unreliable, to be honest. And a lot of the coaches were questioning the accuracy and the time investment in terms of why do we do this when it's taking so long and sometimes it doesn't work. So Weaver basically reinvigorated um, the use of biomechanics in Australia. One of the issues with their gate is that you had to take the whole pin off. So you couldn't just slip a gate off and put a new one on. You actually had to take the whole pin off. And they, they do still exist, you can still buy them. Okay, I don't know, probably this has been floating around for a little while now. Nelson Kelman have come out with the clean power gates. Um, again, <coughs> it's modelled around gates that we pretty much use now. It's designed to take one gate off, put the new one on, very simple to install. But the beauty, well, the, the selling point of this is that it hooks in straight into your cop tank or your, um, your speed coach, sorry. So you, the information you're getting off this is coming live to the athlete on their speed coach as they're training. Um, and that's their selling point around this. It is wireless. If you want to look at more in-depth information, they don't, the gates don't sit together in terms of the car coming up very easily. You need to do that post. You need to spend some time lining up that bar up. Um, we will discuss where this is going. Um, so that's reasonably new. I don't know if anyone's ever met Valerie Kreshner, who used to work in Australia quite a number of years ago. This is in conjunction with NK and Valerie Kreshner Bio Road uh, out of the UK. And I have read something about New Zealand having their own system. I've no idea what it is, I haven't seen it. They did definitely use Peach Powerline a few years ago, but I did see um, a sneaky little uh, job at Verdeman recently actually, where they reference their own system. I don't know what it is. And by no means are these all of them, but these are probably the most popular ones currently in terms of gates. As I said, you can now, well, going, people are now going back to instrumenting oils. Why were the instrumenting oils not the gate? Easy to move between boats. Yeah, you have to change the pitch, you have to change the gauge. Um, so the concept smart or very sneaky of them to put on their website, picture of it on the program hall. Um, <laughs> so basically it's a little box that sits on your on your wall, which will give you power. It's just spitting out a power number. You don't you can't go in and get any more information off it. Basically just gives you power. And so it probably uh, catch angle. Finish angle if you get the additional little doobie bit that sits on top of the gate. Okay. The um, drawback of this is you have to send it to them. You have to send your walls to Concept and they will install that piece of equipment on it. And as far as I'm aware, it doesn't come. Similar thing, Weaver Power. We spoke about Weaver before, been around for quite a number of years. Um, they've now gone back to invest in an oil flexion device. Similar thing. Um, same concept, this one you can put on and off yourself, okay? Sweet Spot, which I haven't heard of until just recently. Uh, they actually started off with a rowing app. 
Now they've gone into the hardware side of it. Similar concept to Weaver and concept is that you're attached with a strain gauge duty onto the door and it starts giving you the information. And I'm pretty sure Croker don't do these anymore, but I'd really like to look at the dials and the lights and the handle of an oar, so I always put it back up. Um, Kroger did look into through Sydney Uni, Uni of instrumenting all handles. Australia growing invested in this. Um, none of the oars can give you accurate catch and finish angles. They can give you overall angle. They can't do the catch and finish angle because it's in three dimensional space. I haven't worked out the maths to try and give you that data. So that's why the concept one has that one on top of the gate. So that's going to give you the catch and the finish angle. They can't do off the way. So I think that's been the trick stumbling block for the crow girls is that they can't, with that technology, identify the catch and finish angle. They give you absolute, they give you power, they can't tell you where you've been playing for each quarter, which is a bit of an issue. Um, the other thing that's an issue with these is if you don't run the concepts, you run the crow because they feel different. You run the croakers and you run the concepts and the wood element, they feel different. And you're always looking to not make it different when you put on testing equipment. Because if it feels different, the pattern changes. They don't row the same. So if you're looking to make sure it's a replication of how they would row if they had nothing more. Um, so one of the things that, that I find interesting, and it's, it's only coming about in the last couple of well, last short period of time, is the driver behind instrumenting a lot of this stuff was to get what I call, because I'm a biomechanist, biomechanical data. So we're looking at force, we're looking at angle, we're looking at boat movement, boat velocity, at 50, 100 times per second. So it's high resolution, high accuracy, um, high data outputs, so we can look at technical changes in small parts of the street. There's a real movement at the moment with some of these things, um, the NK M-Power gate, one of them, the concept and the Weaver attachments on the oar, is moving to just getting instant power per stroke. So the athlete goes out, they row along, just like if any of you have done any cycling, if you watch the Tour de France, you watch any cycling, cycling embraces a number of years ago of training with power. And a lot of your athletes probably do it in the ergo. Okay? There's a shift at the moment for this technology to go from high resolute, high data to giving power. And that's basically the number that we're looking at. Um, it's an immediate number. It's related to stroke rate. So if your athlete is putting in the same amount of effort at stroke rate 18 through the drive, compared to stroke rate 36 through the drive, the power will be different because we're doing it for the shortest period of time because it's averaged over the entire stroke. But it is definitely related to boat speed as well. We see an, uh, a relationship of about 0.85 between power and boat speed. So there is definitely a relationship there. If you put down more power, the likelihood is you will go faster. And there's a bit of discussion around in, uh, in other aquatic sports, and I presume it's going to start coming more and more, is a better prescription for training. So we may go out and, and say, especially in Perth, go and row at rate 18, or go and row at two minutes or one minute 50. But we know that our water here is shifty, we have currents, and wind affects us a lot. Is power a better prescription? I heard an example the other day, some of you may have heard it on the podcast, of the same crew using power, rowing up the course and down the side of the course, same lane, and all they've done is turn around, straight across. Two minute average split one way, two minute 10 split the other way, power is identical. So their belief is that they should start to look at training with power more. Okay? And I think you're gonna see more of a push around this as a prescription <coughs> as training. Just like cycling does, there's other sports that are starting to do it more and more as well. And you guys do it on the air, okay, I presume. You may get a percentage of your 2,000 uh, your two meter average power and do work at that level. That's where this is going to go as well. But it's not the be all and end all, okay? Power doesn't always equate to faster speed. It's only half the battle. So if I've got gates on and I want to get my power to go up, I haven't pulled any harder. How can I shift my power? Anyone know? <coughs> no strokes. Uh, without changing your rate, without changing your heart on pulling, I can make the power change. How? I go deeper. I just hack the shit out of the bike. Boom! Down the bottom of the lake. 
guess what happens? When power goes up, speed is crap. It looks good because I'm powering up. And I've seen the actual athletes understand that. And so when they get one link, they go deep, the boat goes no faster or slower, but their power goes up. So if you just track power and not rhythm or length or cadence or depth, you'll kill yourself. Because more power is not necessarily more speed. More power is more speed if you're growing more. So these numbers are all got to be used in conjunction with the technique, the speed, the rate. Because you can shift power by going deep, 100%. Um, so, oh, I'm just, I've recently, literally just listed a couple, well, number of apps there, I'm not going to read them out, but they do some of the stuff that we, probably five years ago, was purely in the ballpark of biomechanics. We used to have to rig up an entire boat, put out quite a lot of expensive equipment to see some of this data. And I'm talking about the acceleration of the boat, this top <coughs> picture of a smartphone there, these apps are now giving live stroke by stroke acceleration curves. It's like how is the boat responding to how we're moving the final power in the boat. Um, some of them even link it up to video. And as I said, that was that was purely my area five years ago. I got put down the job. But so it's becoming more and more powerful and it's going to become more and more powerful purely through the smartphone. Okay? Um, some of them are using, you can use it to actually log your kilometers, log your rows, start to monitor where your training sessions are at. Um, and some of them you can even go through and have a look at your, your piece and log it on GPS. And you can go through and troll through that and see what's your speed, what's your rate, where were you throughout your training session. This become, I think, is an area that's going to become more and more, like most smartphone stuff, more and more valuable and more and more applicable to run, especially at club, school, places we don't want to start investing 10, 15, 20 thousand dollars in some technology. There's plenty of them around. And there's more. And I put three big ticks next to the old trusty video camera because to me that is still one of the most essential pieces of technology that you as coaches are being involved in growing can use. Okay? No, but I think um, feedback for athletes, they need to see it visually. And if you're not getting the response you need, you need to show them. The only problem with video is it's after the fact. It's much better if you can show them a video, take a video, show them on the water, and then get them to try and change it and video it again. Rather than do the whole session, come in on the land, show them, and they don't get to try it until tomorrow or the next day. It has made less of an impact. If you can video, if you've got an iPad, take it over to them, show them a video. Look, because their perception is always generally warped. What they perceive and what's actually happening is not the same thing. And when they make a change, it was terrible, you have a look. Oh, it's not as bad as I think. No, okay, keep doing it. So if you can use a video and actually give them more instant feedback, you'll probably get a quicker response. Which is an outstanding segue into my second point, video goggles. Um, especially with the advent of drone technology now, um, you've probably seen stuff on TV, if not you know people, that sit there with their goggles on flying their drones. They're getting immediate feedback from their drone camera live. You can use this technology with your video camera. Okay? The good video goal was now around two to three hundred dollars. You put a little send up on your video camera, and we've used this in rowing. Um, I've had some amazing results with this in kayaking. We had an Olympic kayaker that we use this on, who traditionally does not like using technology. We convinced her to put them on. She paddled away. We we're going along behind filming her. She was watching herself paddle live. And literally 10 strokes into it, she called out the coach and goes, you know that thing you've been talking to me for like the last three months? And he goes, yep. And she goes, is this what I'm doing? And he goes, yep. And she goes, is this what you want me to do? And he goes, bang on. And she goes, I never understood what you're talking about. Okay? Very powerful. They used to be pretty expensive. As I said, now with the advent of drone technology, I would recommend looking into that. I used to use it when I coached. Okay, didn't use it all the time, but if you've got an athlete who's not getting what he's after, especially in larger boats, you can isolate them out, stick the goggles on for a minute. It's all it needs, and they can then get that information, try this, try that, change this, they can see what the change is in real time. Okay, very powerful. Maybe not do it in a single, because they can't see anything else, <laughs> and it gets really, really weird. Um, 
Mind you, Rose, use that because I got nervous. <laughs> um, utilize your ergo, okay? A lot of us jump on, we do the training session, maybe we write some scores now, okay? Most of the ergs, you can stick a card in, you can export the data, start keeping the logs of what you guys are doing, okay? Look at the splits, track your training, okay? It's a simple piece of technology that every boat shed has, and I think sometimes we don't utilize it quite as well as we could, okay? And that's just more around keeping the data. Which leads me to my next point, even better. Uh, training peaks, traditionally a cycling piece of software. Okay, more and more we're having athletes being heart rate straps. Most of those heart rate strap watches that the straps come on them have GPS on them. Okay, what they're actually doing is logging distance, speed, heart rate, effort, load. Okay, most of those watches, especially for Garmin. You can get them to automatically link to your phone after the session, upload into software which is online called Training Peaks, and you can start monitoring their load individually. You've got their heart rate, okay? It is designed around cycling, but as you can see here, and I'm not a physiologist, I don't understand this, but probably understands it better. But you can get training stress scores, um, you can see where they're at in terms of a stress or a load compared to what your program is saying, okay? So it's, it completes the circle. We give a program, we go out on the water, we think we do the program, but we really sometimes don't know what the athletes. So you, you provide a stimulus to an athlete, and there's a response from the athlete. Some athletes, your program, respond better than others. Why? Because your program suits them as an individual. But if you've got an anaerobic athlete and an aerobic athlete, and you provide them the same stimulus, I guarantee you the outcome might be the same. There needs to be some modification somewhere for the two different types of athlete. So this sort of stuff um, you can you can watch, and over time you can see what is actually having a better impact, and you can target the training not on the water because in an eight you do the same training, but on the land you don't, and in the gym you don't, on the bike you don't. So and if you're in a single scale you can modify. It. So we may give. Um, predominantly aerobic athletes, more anaerobic training, so more hit sessions where they do one minute on one minute off because that's their weakness, so we hit it earlier in the season. But we may put them on an ergo and say, right, you're doing four 10 minute pieces at threshold and you and the anaerobic is still doing that 30 minute steady start because that's going to stimulate the section where they're weaker. So, so we, we try and attack their strength, keep maintaining their strength, keep maintaining their strength, but in different parts of the season, you're targeting their weakness early to give them a chance to adapt because it takes them longer. So this sort of stuff is becoming more and more relevant because it tells us how the stimulus is actually being embraced by the athlete. So it's pretty good information, but um, it can be used too much. And if, you if your athlete's out there watching a heart rate, not a good idea. Just have it on, cover it up, don't let them see it. Um, because if they train on the heart rate, they're probably not training hard enough. That's the reality. If training is just on the heart rate, we're not pulling hard enough. But you need to be able to know what they're doing. So if they hit the wall eventually, you can say, well, actually for the last three weeks, they've been training on threshold, and we wonder why they fell over and got sick. Next time we need to back off a week earlier or pull two sessions because the number one thing that will get you performance outcomes is continuity and consistency of training. So sickness and illness kills you. If you can stay consistent, continuous, surely there needs to be some quality, but even if you didn't have quality and you were consistent and continuous, you would get better. If you miss sessions, get sick, get injured, you get so this sort of stuff helps us manage that and start to identify where we might be pushing people too far. So this, the chronic and the acute chronic load, for the purple and the blue, over a while, after a while, you know how long can we push someone with a, a gap of over 100. And we say, it's two weeks. So you can put them in for two weeks and then we have to pull them out for two or three days until the, the chronic load comes back down and then we can go back up again. So if you can start to train, now this is, if you're on a school program, it's a bit hard, but you can still use this data to try and not have kids miss the training, basically. So it's pretty handy stuff, which is becoming more prevalent.
So that basically ends the part where I'm going to talk about the new technology in general. There's plenty more, okay? Um, some of you, maybe, maybe not, are sitting there going, well, hang on, you can keep putting GPS units on these boats. Um, we do use that, it's technology. It's three and a half thousand dollars per unit if you go and buy it from the manufacturer. Um, and I'd say there's things that you can do with smartphones and other things that you're going to get almost just as good information. So we're not going to talk about that. What I am going to do now is talk a little bit around peach. It's not because I sell peach or I'm involved with peach, it's just this is the information that we use. As I said, it's pretty much the current standard in Australia. I think that will change eventually. Uh, Rowing Australia uses it, all the state institutes use it, and there's a plethora of schools around Australia. So what I'm going to do now, and I'm fully aware some of you have seen this information, um, yeah, please. Um, I'm fully aware that some of you use this information. Um, I'm going to try and go through this reasonably quick, quickly so everyone gets a basis of what we're looking at, and then we're going to go <coughs> to more applied live information. Okay? Um, what can it do? I'm not going to go through all them. It does a lot. It measures a whole bunch of variables, and in actual fact, this is part of the list of all the variables that you spit out when you analyse the data. As you can see, there's a scroll, there's a scroll bar down the side, it gets longer. Okay? There's a whole bunch of information that you can look at there. I'm going to put my hand up. I've been doing this for 10 years and I use that information. You can actually pull it. Okay? Um, but there's a whole, all this stuff here and we will go through that very quickly. But you can end up tracing your tail. Unless you decide what you want to look at, what's important for me, you can end up going around and search. Um, so, if you are going to start using this information, or if you do use this information, or any sort of similar information, it doesn't have to be features, my strong suggestion is, these probably should be the other way around, what makes the gut flow go faster? Okay? You don't have to fix all 10 things that you picked up on the data. You decide what is the important one, or two, they're going to make my boat quicker, and let's track that, let's monitor that. Okay? As I said, points to monitor, trend it, Always look at it versus boat speed. Okay? Boat speed is your key outcome. We may sit there and go, we want this person to row five degrees longer. And we spend three months getting to row five degrees longer. And I don't go any quicker. Okay? And we could have seen that a month into it, right? They're rowing longer. We've got no changes. There's somewhere else we can spend out. Okay? Always monitor versus an outcome. I honestly can't remember how many of those in there. Um, you can use it to look at boat setup. This is where I'd encourage the basic first time I stick it on a boat. If we haven't seen these athletes before, this is the first port of call for me. Are they set up in the boat? Okay. Um, so I'm not going to go through all the numbers, but we can very quickly get an accurate indication of what is their potential length, how far can they reach out to the catch, which are the negative numbers down this column. Okay, and as we can see from that crew, it's fairly variable. We've got bow seat at 44 degrees, and we've got six seat at 57 degrees. That's a fairly big difference. Okay, so it's an immediate snapshot of where are the crew set up. Um, and we then look at the finish position, which are the positive numbers, and we can actually say this crew's not even set up at the finish. So why would we start bothering about how long are they running at the catch? when they're quite variable, 44 degrees to 33 degrees between two and three seconds. Okay? So we can use it to set up quite quickly, get them set up in the right position before we then go and analyse and comment and look at the rest of the um, Anyone that uses this, catch slip always jumps out. It's basically a measure of my potential, how far can I reach, and I'm talking about catch, catch slip, there is a finish slip as well. What's my full reach compared to where am I applying effective to this? Okay. Um, a lot of, just let them know the difference between when it's effective and when it's not. Yeah. So the way that Peach does it, and um, you, can adjust it too, you can adjust it, the Nelson Kellerman gate will give you catch slip and finish slip. It's important to understand what it is. Okay. And the way that both of these work. Especially if you have a female or a male. Absolutely. The way that both of these work. Um, so catch slip is how far can I reach, what's my full potential length and in sweep rowing compared to buying 30 kilos, 20 kilos, 
it's a number you can change. So how, far, how long does it take me to apply a certain percentage of force? If I've got an athlete whose peak force is 60 kilos, a girl, compared to a big behemoth guy who's maybe 110, it's actually going to be fair if I find the comparing between the two. Absolutely not. Because one's a much higher percentage of their feet than the other. Okay? So be careful when using catch slip. It can be effective, but I would encourage you to look at the next slide and you're going to visually see what we're talking about. Is there any questions about that? I'm going through this pretty quick. I do realise that. We can send out this chain, can we send yeah. out yet yeah, what the people are looking for with the what are the ones you've got catch and finish? Is that milliseconds or something? Sorry, the catch? This is angle. No, on the, on the top for angle, the angle. two right hand columns, catch and finish. These ones? No, oh, these ones. ones. Uh, that's catch and finish then. That's how long it took before Sorry, they that is, So that's exactly what I'm talking about. No, it's an angle. It's how yeah. far they move before they yeah. got the load on. So what we're seeing here, this person up the top who we're saying is quite short, only has a catch of 4 yeah. degrees. Just contradicting myself, don't always compare between people, but we're then getting at 12 degrees. So there's something going on there in terms of how they're applying force. So there's a column you're saying effective length. You yeah, might find the one that's running the shortest is actually not slipping as much yeah. as the one who's running the longest. So the effective length is important. It's not on here, but it's something you can look at. And the best way I would advise you is, is trend within your athlete. Yeah. What is my athlete doing now compared to next week, compared to next month, and compared to next week? What I would suggest is you take it, you have all the data, and you analyse what you think you need to work on, and you coach them technically, and you stop looking at the data. Don't look at it. As coaches, don't look at it. Coach the athlete, coach the athlete, coach the athlete. Right, let's test it again. Shit, all this coaching I did, and I haven't changed. Because it's your fault. Because they're trying. I guarantee you they're trying. It wouldn't be there every morning at stupid hours most people don't do, if they're not changing, it's my problem, not their problem. I haven't communicated the right way, I haven't expressed it the right way, I haven't given them the right cues, I haven't stimulated them enough, because I guarantee you, most of them are trying if they come into realm. As kids at that age and people out here, they're trying. So if they haven't changed, and you're coaching them, change the way you're coaching. That's my suggestion. So the bars on the left are it's just basic thing. So you can see no slip is the little white thing. Yeah. Um, with, with those, that's purely a peeps thing, depending on what. If you do use some of this equipment, you may look obviously disappear somewhere. Um, so the key thing that we've looked at since 1973, whenever people started, well, actually earlier, is force versus angle curves. This is your typical, what you're going to get out of the, all of these kind of systems. So that's the catch. You then reduce force through the drive. Um, peak force is generally around 20 degrees in front of square. That's something you should look at? Yep. Where the peak force is generated? Um, you, this data? you then come through onto the finish, laid away, you can have a little tail, you may not have a little tail, and then through the couple. Same information on the right hand side, buttons versus time. So the reason I've chosen this information if we just looked at that force angle, we're thinking these guys are matching up pretty well. Okay, look how look how similar they are. Then we look at versus time, uh -huh. they are late. Okay, so I encourage you if you do the have this information, look at it in different manners. Okay, some ways that you present data can be deceptive. And what else is deceptive is what's an ideal curve. Okay, I would present that top curve as being really, really, really good. You probably glance at that bottom curve and go, that's not real good. But that crew won a Sarah. Silver medal. Silver medal crew going like that. Okay. So data's not be all and end all. I do think so. The the, um, the curves I, I was looking at it thinking one's bow and one's the stroke or this is a sweep ball both. This is a sweep ball pair. Red will be, these are different red people. Will be straight and Absolutely. green will be the bow. Absolutely. So the top one is one crew. Red is straight. The bottom one is a, is a different crew. Usually, you look at the top one and go, wow, wow, that's my crew. You look at the bottom one and go, what am I going to do? Well, don't look at those curves and say you're going around in the corner. Then you've got the area under one is greater than the other. 
It is in a pair. I'm not going to get into the mechanics of throwing a pair down a course because if you do that, if you do that, it's going to go like this. Um, but the, the idea of this slide is it's relevant to the athlete and their performance. Okay, and what you always see isn't always what you think. That top chair is pretty good though. So um, I'm just going to quickly go through some of the things you can pick out, and again, I've picked these for specific reasons. Um, we're talking about catch slip and finish slip. I prefer to look at the curves. This person comes out with a catch, places the blade quite nicely, develops force. To me, that's a pretty good front end. Okay? This person comes out, reaches out to here, there's a, well, I turn a duck tail, boom, <laughs> and then starts to develop force. Okay? That's not as good a front end. Yeah. So that's quite different. Okay? So a really good example of probably good front end, placement, connection, drive, not as good. You look at the back end, you've got this big flat tail. They're coming out and then still falling back off of the wood. Okay? This person, unfortunately it's not, I might have to go like this, um, is actually a bit better around the back row. They hold it slightly, it's not a great curve. Um, but that's two examples of good at one end, not so good at the other. The other thing you can use this sort of data for is consistency. All those little red lines is every stroke for a minute. All those little red lines is every stroke for a minute. Okay? And we know better athletes are more consistent in the in force application. Guess which one the better athlete? Okay? So that's another thing we look at cons consistency. How well are you applying something? If you're not applying force or any sort of movement consistently, your motor pattern has not been ingrained as much as it can be. You're still learning what you're doing. Once you've got an ingrained motor pattern on the other side, you're moving towards the expert side. So that's going to be important. Um, the other thing we can look at is timing. Okay, left, good crew, right. Less in four, time. Four different lines. Yeah. So that's four. So this is a four. So left one, I'd be pretty happy if that was my boat in terms of how you're applying force. Right hand, a little bit of work to do. Um, this is something I'm just going to present. Most of you wouldn't have seen this. Um, we've only just managed to abscond with a couple of pairs of these to have a play with, and it's some really good information. But I've always said, what we look at in terms of gate force, handle force, whatever you want to look at, is half of the half of the equation. Okay? I haven't got a little force diagram which I used to put up. We've got propulsive force on the gate. Any force that goes on the foot stretch is in the opposite direction. And it's the balance of those two forces which move the gate. Okay? So what's happening around the feet is really, really, really important. And most of the times we don't see it. Okay? So what these ones do, again, these are peach systems. Um, these are the only ones I've ever used. I presume other ones give you the same information. But it's resolved into vertical force on the feet, the foot stretcher, and horizontal force on the foot stretcher. We get balance between left and right on the foot stretcher. It's not measuring the individual feet. It gives us a balance of where is the centre of pressure left and right. And it also gives us the centre of pressure up and down, which we term fuel toe. Okay, where we're pressing it through the feet, through the drive. And we're going to look at a bit of information on this. Um, again, it can give us timing in terms of when are we pushing in the boat, rather than when's the blade in and when are we driving, when are we actually starting that initiation of the drive with the boat. Um, it gives us a really good bit of indication if someone's falling in the mechanic. Okay, generally we see that, but it gives us an indication, it gives the athlete a picture of, oh yeah, I can see the force saying come up, has this movement in my body coming out of the catch. It can tell us if we disconnect off the foot plate through the back end. Okay. If we keep driving and come off the foot plate and we're still trying to draw the blade out, there's nothing to press against. It's very hard to have a clean and strong finish if we've come off the back of the foot plate. It's difficult to rock back over because you've gone too far back and you're not going to get back over. So staying connected with the foot stretcher through the finish is a critical part of the stroke. This can measure that. And of course it tells us how we press, how do we press on the foot stretcher as we go. So what we would say is toe presses, you've got to change them. Because if they press on their toe the whole time, they don't stay connected to the back, they tend to dump, 
have trouble getting back over and have problems later in the race. People that can get the pressure a bit more towards the heel are better connected, have their glutes engaged, which is a big part of a transfer of the power, and they can then push better in the back half rate because they've conserved a bit more. They're using more of their muscle groups. So this is basically a snapshot of a pair. We've got bow and stroke, not that it really matters. The green is the horizontal force. The blue is the vertical force. I'm not going to talk too much. There's two points I'm going to show in this. This tail indicates that as this individual comes out of the catch, it's falling into the front. The pressure goes down onto the foot stretcher too much. And they're not staying up and drawing themselves forward, they're falling down onto the foot stretcher. This individual does it. Generally, you can't avoid it, but this sort of tail is more of an indication of too much. Okay? The other thing I want to demonstrate again for green is the horizontal force. This is the recovery. This is the recovery. That's the force on the foot stretcher in the recovery. This is a pair. They row together. What are we seeing differently between the two of them? Let's just talk horizontal force through the recovery. So release, starting to pull on the foot stretcher to pull themselves up into the boat. I look at this all the time, I see it pretty easily. There's different strategies. There's completely different strategies on how they're moving in the recovery. One's got a lot of arm on. No, no, this is just feet through the recovery. We're we'll looking at this recovery. part here. You, you haven't heard, this you're coaching someone. He said, yeah. what's happening in the recovery? Yeah. Talking about arms? He's talking about the recovery. What's happening in the recovery? And what's the difference in the shape? So this is force pulling on the foot stretcher in the recovery. Green to the left. In the recovery. Neutral, okay. not neutral. Coming forward differently. Approaching the front turn at different speed, potentially. Yeah, the way they I actually didn't put that, but they absolutely do. This person, through this part, the early part of the recovery, pulls themselves up. Okay, they're actively engaging and pulling themselves forward. This person does, but it's a much more constant. This one's an accelerated recovery. This one's a one speed recovery. Okay? They're trying to roll both together. Funnily enough, they finish off pretty nicely. By the time they get to the catch, things are going to be tippy. Who's this through? Sorry? Who's this through? I'm through not through. at liberty to say who it was because yeah. I haven't got permission to use that. Uh, oh, sorry, ready stroke? Oh. Green is about. Sorry, I thought you asked yeah, yeah. it. Two is yeah. stroke. More. Two is stroke. Yeah. But very different recovery strategies in terms of how they move. And if you actually have a look at their handle speed, which is something we can track, they're completely different. Strokes is slow to fast, bows is yeah. okay. very, very different in terms of how they move in the boat. This is the same individuals. We're looking at vertical force, and we don't need to understand too much. The stroke falls into the front more than the back. Okay? As she comes up into the front, boom, then back up again. Because what happens on the way forward, we need the rest of them in the back. And Stroke is pushing off earlier than down. Okay, so she's engaging her leg drive earlier than down. So this is really important because we look at the timing and in actual fact in this crew, you can see they're not in time, but sometimes we get stuff that we can then see where it's engaging. Now again, you don't have to understand it all. This is the higher this up, the higher up on the foot plate we drop, starting from in the drive. So from the catch driving through to the finish. So basically we start high on the feet, stay flat, and then the heels engage. Both these girls do that pretty well. Okay, that's the idea, that's what we want to look at. Starting on the foot, on the balls of the feet, driving down through the heels through the back. Okay, big tick for the two of them. This one is looking at balance between left and right. Okay, generally in sweep, we start at the catch, loaded more on our inside leg than our outside leg. And as we come through the drive, it transfers across. And we finish off the second half more on the outside leg. I'm not saying you go and coach that person, but that's what you can. It's a good technique. Bow does that nicely. Tick. Stroke does it pretty well from here. But what she's actually doing is coming in on her right leg, 
coming into the front on her right leg, middling up as she's at the front, starts to push over onto the left, and then rows the way we want. So she's coming in and doing this, rather than coming in over her leg, rotating around, running around the thing, seeing where she should be. So we could do something like this, measuring the pair, yep. uh, all the depending on what's going. Is all the steering taken out? Because the steering there was steering in this, absolutely. Steering percentage of something. No doubt. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, that was consistent through the 16 odd kilometres. Actually, uh, this is a snapshot, and it was absolutely consistent. And the other thing you can use for is race profile. Um, again, I'm not saying you go and compare power. So, this is an 8. This is the power that they produced throughout the entire 2000 metre race, stroke by stroke. Okay. I'm not saying you go and go two seat mine, you're doing what seven seats doing. We're probably completely different animals. But we can actually look at what they're contributing in terms of their own capacity through the race. Okay? Um, so I'd say two seat starts off low, but he's right in the mix at the end. Okay? If you know that he's not as big, you know he's not as strong, do you worry about that? Or you go, you know what? Nice work. You're driving with the boys that last thousand metres. The other thing that's really interesting to look at here is when the crews kick, okay, and who goes. So I've seen some, some graphs of this that I've sitting there and gone, your eight, seven, six are gone, and no one else has gone with it. Because you can see you jump, you know the rates jump, but the other guys haven't been able to go with it. So is that a good strategy? Only three you drive around to do it? Possibly not. I'm going to rush through because no? What's happening in those dips? Um, I have no idea. Probably not system. It's probably a, it's probably a little a wash or a little clip. Um, if that was a crew that you're taking a first out crew, you're taking Henry River to calm day, I'd be extremely concerned about that. You, the thing is, you really want to know, you should know what's happening. Again, don't look at data in isolation. Okay, I know that they have a little horse here, 600 metres to go. But if you don't know what happened when you see it, then you can start questioning the language. <laughs> right, I'm going to really rush through this um, because I know we're going over time and I still want to do some demos. So, boat acceleration is a really important thing. There's many, many ways. The pattern of rowing always stays the same. We have a dip as we come up the recovery. Sorry, we come off the back, we accelerate the boat underneath us. When we start to put pressure on the feet, the boat decelerates till we put the blade in continues to decelerate slightly as we're locking and starting to drive. We have an initial peak. So the catch is here. Catch is here. Long. This is your main drive, your legs are operating, your, your body's adding onto it, your arms are coming in, we get a nice peak. We step out, hands away. Okay? You can't avoid some of those big dips and bumps because that's how rowing works. We move up and down in the boat, the boat will stand still. Okay? What you can see are three completely different in the realms of what I just said, acceleration curves. This person doesn't accelerate the front of the boat at all. This person does quite well, and this person has a different method again. This one has a bump in it, and they accelerate the whole thing. Okay. So we can start monitoring that, looking at people, and there's certain technical aspects which cause these shapes of acceleration curves. Okay. If I was going to pick one, I'd take their recovery and entry with their, or even that, acceleration. So we can start tracking that, we start monitoring it, we start looking at it in relation to video and we know what the technique is and start making changes. I'm going to ignore that one because we're way out of time and I encourage you strongly if you're using this information, always sync it with video as much as possible. And I'm going to let you absorb my funny thing because it's good. I'll never get a laugh out of it. Um, and I'm going to go into some examples. So just before we move into examples, all this stuff only works if the athletes are training. So you can be as cute as you want about, we're going to go and fix up our catches, but if they're not fit in training, it's not going to make a very big difference. So all this stuff has to be used in context around um, people training. And once you've got a certain amount of training, then this stuff starts to make a difference. 
You don't do this first. This is this should be done once people have done more training and had a bit more skill development because they're not consistent enough, number one. So they might do one great session and the next one they're terrible. So you need to be up to be aware of all this stuff we're talking about. You need to be um, you need to make sure they're at a certain level before you start giving them too much information. Well, I'm going to, I did have a slide up there that's a question, none of your last picture. Um, is there any questions before we go on? Now I do realise that we get stressed for time. I am rushing, but I don't want to not take in any questions or anything you guys want. Because that's what it is. Yeah. Uh, the foot stretcher comes as part of the system, well, an addition to the system. Um, you probably can't use foot stretcher force without gate force. Therefore, you're looking at using peach. This is really ballpark, and I'm going to go probably 1400 on this. If not more. And that's only a seat. And that's only the sweep. If you're talking about a single, add another probably 300 more. They might even be zeros on top of that. So, what I'm going to show you here, and I'm going to quickly run through how this works, and they're all the same methodology. But what you could do is tell people to try and push onto the bottom of their ball and foot. You don't need foot stretcher to tell them that. And you can see it, because if people are like this, they're probably not on the heels. If they're falling off the back, well, they're not on the heels. You don't need that data, but you, all you need to know is. We're telling you that if you do it this way, it's faster and it's more efficient. You don't need the data to be able to see someone pushing on their toes, pushing straight up in the air or losing their feet. You, you can actually just talk about trying to feel your feet pushing on the heel. So we're, what I've got here is four different examples of some crews and some information we've found over the years. Um, We've got video, obviously, I apologise for this quality of video, it's our old camera. And it's synced up to the data from the finances. The top one in this situation is no change, I do apologise. But at the moment we've got force, bows for, uh, green is always left hand, red is always right hand. Um, bow is the lighter colours, if you can see them, they don't come out very well on the projector. Stroke is the darker colour. Okay, um, just a little Heads up, and then sort of not. Um, and where the black sorry, line is, sorry, so this is force, this is force on the gate, and this is or angle. Okay? Um, and where that frame of video is, is this black line. So you notice as I scroll along, the video will advance. Hang on, when you say or angle, you're talking about that? No. Oh, that length. angle, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, this is one of my favourite examples of generally when we use this information, it backs up what you see. And I always tell coaches, trust your eye, use the information to back up what you see. Okay? This is the opposite, which is why I like this. Um, double, we're going to just have a look, look at long at a few strokes. But generally, bows in early. Bows in early, oh sorry, before stroke. Bows in before stroke. And bows in before stroke. Okay? So I'm going along coaching these guys. I'm like, I won't pick on them. Bow, you're early, you're early, you're early, you're early. Okay? If we look at their oar angles, they're matching up pretty well. So their reverse in direction pretty similar. If you look at their force, bow, lighter colours, so the bow is forced much later than stroke. Okay? What's going on? She's got the blades in. She's a good roller. Okay? We know she can move the blade. But consistently, she's behind whatever strokes do in terms of force application. To me, she should be on that position at least achieving the same force as what strokes doing in that position. If not more. Okay? Anyone know why? Just get through this pretty quick. The shoulder is The shoulder is Yep. And what's that doing? She's moving through the mass too early in the uh, drive. Yep. Exactly. 
Okay? She rows the blade. The blade's in the water. It's not connected. So we need to be aware of sometimes that what we see has a really obvious cue, you're half a blade early. We need to sometimes look deeper. Because she puts the blade in, and I can't really see it from this angle. What she actually does, she rows it in. So she rows in, and it's not until she's here that she's actually ready to connect and drive the boat. Okay? So in other words, we don't talk to her about being you're early, you're early, you're early. We talk about being connected, connected, connected. Okay? So any questions, any comments around that? Please tell me you guys like that as much as I do. <laughs> any comments there, Rick? Uh, I think I think just because the blade's in doesn't mean they're actually applying pressure. So if someone's putting in shoulders, they're not connected here. She's look at the angle. Yeah, the blade's on him, but the angle of the body. If she's gonna load up, she's not loading up. But she's also been coached to be quick on the catch, quick on the catch. So she's been quick on the catch, but it's not been in the boat. So sometimes going back to the coach and say Okay, you've got her moving quick, but she's not connected. How do we change the way, because this girl's a good rower, how can we change the way she applies her force and you still see her being quick? So that's just the, the thing for me is, um, it's all about connection, it's not about speed. And the worst part of the stroke to be not connected is the stroke, is the catch, because you're both moving the slowest. So, the number one place you should be concentrating on is the last part of the recovery and the first part of the drive. So Rhett, what sort of drill would you get her to do to well, fix that? When we got her, drills, static drills would be push-pulls. So she puts a blade in the water, pushes back against the water so it's loaded, and then she presses. And she won't be able to pull a body like that if the blade's locked, because it's too much load. But if she's sort of not connected, she can just tear the water. So push-pull type drill, she did a lot of those when she was in the junior double. Um, legs only, where she just stays forward. Um, entry slaps, where she's got to hear the blade before she starts to move, stuff like that, anything. Yep. You can work out whatever drill you want, but it's got to be something to help her change. And that's what I'm saying, if, you, if she's doing that in two weeks time, and you've been coaching her, you failed, not her. I failed, if you she's doing that in two weeks time, I've done something wrong, not her. So, yeah, connection around the front, critical point. And the reason is because this is the acceleration of the boat, and the boat is what's going to win you the race, how fast the boat can travel, average speed. So, if we spend too much time in this area, in the slow part, then we're giving everyone else, you might as well say, we're going to sit on the start line for four seconds, and then we're going to go because we want to give you this much start because we slow the boat down that much. So we're just still on the start line, you take your four second lead, and then we'll take off. Doesn't make sense to me. So trying to minimize this time in the deceleration, and when she's not accelerating, it's still in deceleration. She's not helping the boat go quicker. So that'd be something you'd be pretty on to. Anyone want to ask anything? We're good? Cool. And Rhett has once again given a beautiful seat of that. You don't want to ask that. We didn't want to ask this. Right. Um, no, I can see it. Caleb Angel, under 23, Nancy Scarlett just went to Worlds. There's a few things here. I'm really putting him in for one thing. Um, so on this day, as we usually do, we actually had a couple of boats find end up. Um, I obviously don't film the entire 20 odd kilometres of the rows, so we pick a segment and film it, that's the thing. Okay. Um, one of the things we really noticed about Caleb in this piece is, and Rep was just reflecting on it, the shape of the acceleration curve, how much time we're spending in a decelerated mode. Okay. There's various things that are going to affect that. One of it is when we're coming through the recovery when we start to put our feet pressure under the pressure. Okay. And the other thing is the balance, the difference between when we arrive at the front and when we place the blade in. 
this little acceleration normally it's flat, flat into a V and then up, we have a real indicator of, and I'll step through it, indicator of arriving, I see it stop moving. Okay? What forces are on the boat at this point? It's all negative. Hang on. My body weight is sitting on the foot stretch. Okay? It has to be in that direction. The only thing, the boat doesn't slow down. Decelerate more because I'm steady, but all that's happening is my boat's slowing down. Okay? Then my blade gets down a third ferry, which is typically where this V appears on the acceleration. And then I start to lock on and everything locks, everything starts to move. So this area here, that time spent in that area, that area under the curve, is period that the boat's slowing down while I'm sitting in the front, pretty much doing absolutely nothing. Okay? Um, this is a good example. And the reason I put this example up is because we then do the feedback from Caleb afterwards and we spoke about this. And he said, um, he goes, yeah, I didn't, that piece wasn't the best one I did that morning. And he had to buy back one, he had power sitting there. I always tell them to ignore the power, we're just collecting data, because you have to show power. And Caleb likes to play when he rows. And I call playing it when you start, you start trying things on your own. What do I do, 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 He plays it when he rows. And he actually said, I was working on something else on the way back up. The power was the same, but my split was bad. So my power, same rate, my power was, didn't change, but I went faster, okay? And we said, well, what did you do? And he goes, I didn't really don't know. He goes, I was playing around with my catch, I was trying something different, but I actually don't know what I was doing, but it was better. So I went, Kayla, okay, where was it? Unfortunately, in this software, we can go through a real little map here, and as we scroll through, we can see where it is. And he goes, I was around about this point. So we zoomed in on that point. And his acceleration curve had changed. Okay? Whatever he was playing with, he had actually started to place his blade with arrival of the set. He actually wasn't aware of that's what he'd done fully. I think that's what he was trying to do, but he really couldn't articulate it. Okay? And that was the difference. And the speed was better, the power was the same, he went quicker. So there's a really important, and that's what I said previously, ages and ages and ages ago, about power, it's only half the battle. We spend half the time, when we race, approximately, in the recovery. And how we move in the recovery is really, really important. And that's one of the aspects of how we move in the recovery, which can make a big difference. Um, I went and had a quick look today. I think the, the average split dropped by around two to two and a half seconds. Okay. Um, I'd take that. Anyway. And it felt easier. And it felt easier. Yeah. So, a um, few messages out of that. Encourage your athletes to play. If they're developing skills and if they're at a level where you're not just giving them feedback that they're following, encourage them to play for things. Okay? Um, a fair bit of research around in terms of experts have learned to get to the very top by discovering things themselves, not being told about it. Any questions? You guys are hard. These are great examples. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to zip back to the normal one to the first. Current under 23, world's best time holders, and World Champions. Okay. Um, they did a pretty good job. We went out and had a look at these guys. There's a few things in this that we can look at. One, and they're making a lower because that's not the best image. Pretty much on this day, their approach and catch timing was pretty darn good to immaculate in terms of bottom of the blade, touching the water at the same time, coming up the stroke. Okay? Um, that one maybe not quite as, as good as it could be. Um, but there's a few things these guys here, and if 
anyone was listening, flat spot blue. Okay? Again, absolute telltale of arrival, hip replacement. For some reason, it happens more in sweet spots than it does in stubborn hats. I don't know why. Just tends to. And fours are really hard. Um, but what they do do well is once the blade's in, they accelerate up to a really nice peak. Zero is here, anything above either blade's moving in that way. They hold it up and they've got a really nice full acceleration. Once we're in the water, it goes really nicely. One of the things we can see here, and I'll show you a bit from the side in a sec, seat arrival to blade about a third buried. This is their oar angle. What are we looking at here? Okay, this is them coming out to the catch. This is their oar angle at the catch. And then, forget that, it's a little bit. That's their drive. What, what, what shape would you call that? Static. Flat. They come out and they're sit there. Okay, they're on the they're seat stop. Sit. I'm picking on them a bit. Um, I've seen an Olympic Ford do exactly the same thing. Um, so that's one of the things that we're working on is, what are you doing around the front? The approach, the place with the approach, reverse. Okay, you're wasting time, you're wasting boat speed. If you can imagine, if they place their blade when they arrive at the front, they literally take and slice that whole part out of their deceleration curve and shove it to the back. Okay, the amount the boat slows down through that period, great. Right the boat slows down less, the velocity fluctuates less, you're more efficient. Um, so that's one thing that I wanted to show you guys with this one. The other thing is, and I'm going to zip to the side, just how different their force curves can be. Okay? So they're in, they, as we said, they place pretty well. They actually initiate force at the catch together. The timing is pretty good around that very first. <coughs> but then we've got, I'm going to call it three and a half different curves. Okay, and I've asked these guys if I can use their data. So I'm not picking on them. Bow, his third world championship gold medal. He knows how to row. Very back end. Okay, very back end for a fast boat. It falls pretty quick boat. The quicker the boat, the more front ended we want to be. We want to pick up the speed. Very back ended. I'm going to go through frame by frame. Anyone want to tell me what they see and why they think that's happening? What's happening with the bow? What are we seeing in that one? And the front of the A little bit of a lifter as well. A little bit? Yeah, he does. So he lifts against his legs. So he wants to push his legs, he's trying to push his legs. I encourage any of you that have a wheelchair in your house. Sit on the wheelchair in the catch position and sit up like that. See which way he's. Seat curves. It ain't going to go that way. Okay? So I'm trying to push my legs against the foot stretcher and I'm going to do this, opposing forces. I'm trying to push my legs, but I'm actually pushing backwards by doing this with my body. Generally, especially in sculling, if we have people like that, that front part of their acceleration curve is depressed to flat to even under zero. So the feedback to the bow. Very many ways you can turn it. Block the hips, slide the hips. Okay? So we want to, we didn't talk about initially leg drive. It's not faster legs, because you can see legs aren't down the best. The first message isn't faster legs, because it's not his intent of his legs, that's the issue. It's the way he's opening his body and closing that. So the first piece of feedback or request, which he got anyway before we even went to this, um, is block the hips, slide the hips. Hold the position, connect, slide the hips initially, and then open the body. And this can work for any level of athlete. Absolutely. I understand. I don't care if they're 70 or they're 7. You have to lock this trunk, hold the trunk, use your trunk later in the drive. So if you've got people you're teaching and you see them opening, try and stop them if you can. Try and give them cues, drills. Do not let them use their body too early because they're opposing their own force. So they're not moving the boat the way you want them to. And this guy's won gold medals. Excellent. Um, I'm going to pick on two seats a bit now. He's, no, he's pretty tall. Tallest guy on the boat. 
Um, rows the shortest by about 10 degrees somewhere. Usually about five. Rows the shortest at the front, the shortest catch, tallest guy in the boat. Um, and he's almost the exact opposite of Rob. Okay, that's what Rob's in about. The guy in two is almost the exact opposite, not quite. Rob's hard. In the fact that, and it doesn't happen every stroke, he almost slides his hips too quickly. Okay? There's a tiny little bit of a bum shove in there at okay? As I said, biggest guy. Has he got the best move? Probably the strongest. He's the red curve here. Okay. Second lowest, <coughs> force applied through the drive. Okay. So he's losing connection to the front of the stroke on a different one. He's probably trying to use his legs too quick. And he's just losing, he's not connecting on that initial drive. In a fast boat, once you miss the connection at the front, it's really hard to get back on that because it's keep going away from you. Okay? So he's not too bad, but he's missing that front end because he's not connected as well as two guys in front. Okay? Um, and the two guys in front, you can see the dark red and the lighter green there um, are pretty good. Okay, they're slightly different, they, they do go differently, but they develop force quickly, they develop early, they hold on to it, and they fill the boat out pretty well. Um, we won't go into technicalities, one of them doesn't hold on to it as well, because he falls off it and comes off the back. And doesn't stick out. Actually, we'll go into that. Have a look at three seats four. Okay, it starts to come out early, washes out, loses connection, can't hold on to the force, as we'll stick out. It may not have been the best example, but it trust me, it doesn't matter. Um, so again, this is just an example in a boat, which was very fast, very successful. Okay, visually timing looked pretty good, but there's individual differences in there that we can identify with the help of this, but we can identify with our eyes as well. This sometimes points us where we want to look, but we can't see it. When we start down and we have a look at it, everything we've spoken about then. We can see the boom. If we just watch it, the information just helps us. So that's a point. If you want a good boat, have a full acceleration curve. See how fat that is across the top so you can got this data? That means we're accelerating the boat for a good chunk of time. As you see, people come below, tiny little dip, drops out. This is full. That's a good sign when the boat's fast, this acceleration phase. And then the other thing is the recovery. Matt said it before, but if you watch these guys in the race, they're rating 38 and it looks like 34 because they look like they've got time. And that's created from that freedom on the recovery to allow them to keep moving quick through the drive. So, um, yeah, I think if you've got a boat that's accelerating, it's long, and then as it always looks like it's less stroke rate than what it is, they're probably moving well. So visually when you're watching them and you take your stopwatch and you click the stroke rate and go, oh shit, we're actually on 24, I thought we were on 20. That's usually a good sign that they're actually moving with the speed of the boat. Because they look like they've got more time on the recovery. And the country that does it the best is the Dutch. They don't really do anything on the recovery, but they're just moving. And they do it really well. And Antonio talked about, I think he's brought some of that, that knowledge back into his these boats. And the Dutch, they practice not doing anything on the recovery, just letting the boat constantly run. And that's what they concentrate. And he said a little bit too much. They forget about the drive sometimes. <laughs> but they're looking after protecting the boat on the recovery. And that's why you watch the Dutch crews, and they always finish strong in the last. 500 because they're not overworking in the first 1500. They're still in the boat work, they're still in the boat work, they're still in the boat work, 